Hello everyone and welcome to the Month of Thrills! For those who don't watch my Let's Plays and don't know already, that means it's the month of October for Halloween! All of my Let's Plays this month are horror or otherwise Halloween themed, so I figured why shouldn't my reviews get the same treatment? With that in mind, I'm kicking things off with an interesting duo of games for the DS that Square Enix were convinced wouldn't fly in the US because of lack of shooty shooty bang bang! This is my review of the Nameless Game and its sequel, I, for the Nintendo DS. Both games have roughly the same formula, even if they carry it out in different ways. The gameplay is split into two different types of sections. The first is the real world, so to speak, where it's in first person across both screens and you hold the DS in portrait mode. This is where you look around for things and before too long avoid dangerous spirits called regrets. Yep, regrets, as in you'll regret touching one, so don't. The controls for the original aren't the most natural. You essentially use the D-pad or touchscreen to move around like a tank. Using the D-pad while holding the center of the touchscreen is how you sprint for the aforementioned regrets. It's not really an intensive action game, so the controls do suffice and they don't really get in the way. I arguably improves things though by making the D-pad strafe instead of turn, so it's more like a real FPS. In addition, I also has a mechanic where the main character's eye acts up in the presence of malicious regrets. This is represented by the top screen becoming very distorted like an extreme ripple effect. This really comes into play near the end of the game as you're being chased through a cornrow maze. The other half of the equation is the titular Nameless Game, an 8-bit top-down game that sort of resembles Final Fantasy for the NES. Given this is Square Enix, it's a very appropriate comparison. Largely the same deal as the real world, you're just looking for ways to progress and avoid dangers, but in a different perspective. It's in traditional landscape mode and has more expected means of controlling it. Interestingly enough, the game will often correlate to the real world, like providing clues forward or even changing things there. I arguably improves upon this aspect too, as the 8-bit sections are more sophisticated and varied. The original typically just has top-down sections where you just walk around and talk to people or search for things to progress, but I has more things to it. There are places where you not only have to find the way forward, but avoid regrets and other such pitfalls. It even has side-scrolling sections where you have to platform around and avoid blades. All around, I takes the first game's mechanics and kicks it up a notch. You can tell they used their experience with that game to propel themselves, and that's not to say the first one was bad, but the control scheme doesn't feel as refined. Now this isn't all the game, just the part you control. There's sort of a third section, but it's basically just advancing dialogue. You might compare this part to a visual novel for the most part. You can choose to skip through this, but it's a story-heavy game, so it's best to read through at least on the first go. Since the game allows you to skip through on your first run, it's really up to you. One neat thing is I actually let you choose which of two levels you want to go to early on. Ultimately, the gameplay is serviceable, but it's not the main focus. Square Enix's motivation for not bringing it to the US was that they thought Americans wouldn't appreciate this kind of game. I want to say that's definitely not true, because after all, games like Outlast, and especially what remains of Edith Finch, have gone on to prove that you don't necessarily need to be full of action to succeed. That being said, with the Nintendo DS demographic specifically, it's hard to say if it would have been successful or not. I think it should have been given a chance though, and thanks to an unofficial English patch, can still be given a chance now. I played through both of them and I enjoyed them for what they were. It may be a story-centric game, but the gameplay gets the job done and has some interesting twists and turns. This is what the game primarily focuses on, of course. If you fail to heed the spoiler warning, these malicious spirits will be coming for you in your sleep. Ultimately, it centers around a downloadable DS game that was never given a name. Yep, that's where the nameless game comes from! The game itself is cursed and, like the ring, is said to kill whoever plays it in seven days if they can't complete it. It doesn't have a physical release either, it just downloads itself to the main character's system. Samsara would kill to have such technological convenience, literally. This quickly rings true in the first game where you find someone dead who played the game seven days prior. You even soon after play as a girl who had played it about six days ago, so of course you get to see how she died, being attacked by the spirit of the previous guy who was found dead. Professor Uyama, a teacher, actually acknowledges the possibility of a curse and directs your character through various places to investigate. You go through places like a shopping mall, a hotel, and the office and home of the game developer of the nameless game in question. 
It's also worth noting that both games also have a good and bad ending, with the first game determining if the curse spreads or not, and the sequel determining if the main character's friend is trapped in the game or not. This is one aspect that I would say the original actually does better than its sequel does. In a way, it does kind of make sense, and I can't really blame the sequel for this. The first one broke ground, while the second one was just trying to be the follow-up. It's not going to have nearly the same weight, although that's not to say it was bad either. I takes place a year after the first one and has some winks and nods like the professor from the first game being killed, but it's not as memorable. The first one brought you through the development studio of the titular game within a game and the motives of the developers, so it has a meta quality to it. I get how you couldn't really just copy that, but it does mean the sequel somewhat lacks that punch of the developer's daughter being neglected and in turn cursing the game. For that reason, the first one I'd say has the stronger plot, but I is still solid enough in that regard and I can still recommend both, obviously in order since I is the sequel. Graphically, the real-world section of the game is pretty impressive for the DS. It takes a more realistic style, which obviously showcases the limitations of the Nintendo DS, but it manages to look pretty good, all things considered. There's enough variety in the environments that it never really gets stale and even has some environments becoming corrupted. Later on in a hotel, you even have a flashlight through pitch darkness Dementium style, which is a good-looking spotlight effect. The more visual novel aspects of the game use still images, and the characters can get a touch on Candy Valley, but thankfully they're pre-rendered so it's not too jarring. The only human characters that appear with in-game graphics are the regrets with hollowed out eyes and mouths, so you don't have to worry about the DS sloppily attempting to represent real human faces. Since they're supposed to look unsettling, it actually kind of works to its advantage there. The game will also use pre-rendered cutscenes here and there, and the real world often interlaces with the 8-bit game within a game to affect things. These segments are, of course, deliberately retro 8-bit and very pleasing to look at. Later on, however, the 8-bit game noticeably gets stylistically glitched out and suitably unsettling. It's interesting when something happens in the game, like a regret appearing or disappearing or a symbol to guide you down a certain path, and the real world corresponds with that. It almost gives the impression that the real world and the game's world are bleeding together, which, given the cursed nature of things, is kind of fitting. I hope you're a fan of the 8-bit chip main theme of the 8-bit game, because you're going to be hearing it quite a lot throughout this game. That's not to say that's all it has, and Rico's theme in particular has an interesting guitar riff going on. Still, that main chip tune theme is going to be playing far more than any other to various degrees of decay. Due to the nature of the game, the theme will very often play in a glitch state to make things unsettling or even subtly to guide you down certain paths like Lost Woods and Zelda. The game has little to no use of voice acting, but there is one suitably spooky moment where you play as a character and another who died is heard echoing her name. In the real world segments, it's mostly ambient noise and the sound of your own footsteps, which suitably makes it uncomfortable most of the time. Overall, I think the presentation works for what it needs to do. Any use of music is pretty strategic, especially in the real world segments, and it paints a glitched up, cursed bleeding of two worlds pretty well. I'd say in terms of presentation, the original and I are about even. Eye has a very strong finish with going through a corn maze and the oppressive pixel shifting effect of the cursed eye, but the original's environmental variety is very strong too. The original's finale actually isn't as strong, just a straight path to a bench, but things like the developmental studio more than make up for it. I'm gonna give this one a tie. Both of them are pretty strong presentation-wise and fairly impressive when you consider it's the Nintendo DS we're talking about. The focus group Square Enix turned to decided that Nanashi no Game, aka the Nameless Game, wouldn't fly in the US because you don't shoot things. It's hard to say if that would have been true or not on the DS, but I think it's a real shame they didn't at least try. Since this game, many games have proven that you don't need mindless action to be appreciated. I suppose you can call that hindsight, but I really do think both games offer plenty enough to be of worth. Thankfully, despite not officially releasing, there are English patches for both games, and I played through both on this very channel, shameless self-plug. Both games are pretty linear, story-based horror games, but I enjoyed them for what they were. Both games even have good and bad endings, so there's even some incentive to play through them a second time. Give them a try if you're so inclined, you might be pleasantly surprised by what's essentially the ring, but with Final Fantasy on the NES as a DS game. This has been my review of The Nameless Game and The Nameless Game I. Thank you so much for tuning in with me. This week's epic freebie until next Thursday is Stubbs the Zombie, a really fun game I also played through on this channel. That is it for now. Thank you so much for tuning in with me. Spread this video around like the cursed DS download, and I will see you next time. Capitalize on life, peace out, have a good one, and I'll see you next week.